Hi, and welcome to our origin of life video here in our evolution unit. And so I've decided to go with this really cool graphical representation of the history of Earth, which shows various events, including when we think most of the major lineages of organisms on the planet first evolved as per our fossil record and uh, some other things. But we are going back to the beginning, right? Back to the first life on Earth, the origin of life, which... Ironically, even though Darwin's book is titled On the Origin of Species, it, it does not go into the origin of life at all. And so there's really two scientific thoughts for how life originated. And by scientific, I mean things that science can investigate. I don't mean to, to talk badly about other thoughts about how life originated. I just mean that science can only investigate certain things. And so the two major models are panspermia and abiogenesis. Panspermia suggests that life originated elsewhere and then arrived here on perhaps an asteroid or a comet. And abiogenesis is the notion that life originated on Earth from non-living components that were present on Earth. In this video, we're going to investigate uh, these two possible scenarios. Well, we're really only going to investigate one of them. And then we're going to talk about the four requirements that we need for life to evolve and some of the evidence we have that supports some of those requirements. Panspermia, we're going to kind of leave behind. It is a scientific hypothesis for the origin of life, but what can we say about it? If life originated elsewhere and then came here, that's fantastic, but it would make for a really short video. So we're really going to investigate the abiogenesis hypothesis and look at how this could have possibly happened. Let's make sure we understand where we are in the grand scheme of things. The universe is about 13.7 billion years old from the Big Bang to now. The Earth forms somewhere around here and then we are all the way to the right on this diagram. If we want to look at the history of the Earth, life begins at the earliest about 4 billion years ago and then we get to now. And so if we go to the origin of life and we take the abiogenesis starting point that it's going to originate here on Earth, four things have to happen. The first is that we're going to need the origin of the biological molecules that life is made out of. Those things are then going to need to get organized into cells. We're going to need to develop some sort of information storage molecule. Our modern day DNA is what plays that role for us now. And then we need to get everything in there to reproduce. So let's go one at a time through these. The origin of biological molecules. Methane is a good example of an organic molecule, but it's not really a biological molecule. Organic molecules are any molecules that contain carbon and hydrogen, and biological molecules are really just a subgroup of those organic molecules. So we need to get those biological molecules. Certainly there's nothing special about those molecules in terms of what they're made out of. We'll talk a lot more about that in our next unit when we talk about matter. But how they're, how they're put together is pretty unique. So we need to have some ability to do that. For instance, glycine is one of 20 biological amino acids and these amino acids are joined together in order to make uh, chains of them, which are then put together to make specific proteins. Here's one particular protein, but you can't have proteins if you don't have these amino acids present. And so we need to, these things would have to be present before life could ever originate on Earth. So there's some evidence we can point to to show that we probably don't have to worry too much about this. The first is the composition of non-terrestrial objects. So here is a comet that has been studied extensively and it has been analyzed and found that it contains at least 16 different or organic compounds, including that amino acid glycine. Now, it might not have the other amino acids, but the point here is that you do not need living systems to build these biological molecules. They will form spontaneously if the conditions are correct. And while we're on that topic, we can talk a little bit about this experiment. So this experiment is the Miller-Urey experiment, which was done in the late 50s, early 60s. And this experiment sought to simulate early Earth conditions. And I know this doesn't really look like Earth, but let's talk about what we have here. So the first thing that we have is we have an energy source in a primitive atmosphere. This is simulating lightning. It's thought that there's probably no shortage of lightning and other sorts of energetic events in early Earth. And we've got a mixture of gases that comprise a primitive atmosphere. This is what the gases were thought to be at the time. There's a lot of thought now that these gases are not the actual mix of gases that were present then, but that's not really what's important here. What's important is that these gases do not include oxygen gas, which is present in the modern Earth environment, but we do not think was present at all in early Earth's environment for a variety of reasons that 
we don't need to get into right here. After interacting with the lightning spark, these gases were then passed through a sample of water, which was supposed to simulate the early Earth's oceans. And this system was just allowed to go for a while, several weeks or so. Occasionally, a sample would be taken out and analyzed. And when this mix was analyzed, it was found that the amino acids glycine, alanine, aspartic acid were found in the mixture, as well as other organic compounds, precursors to other kinds of the biological molecules that are needed for life to exist. The point of this experiment is not that this simulated early Earth. The point of this experiment is to show that it, given the right conditions, you can get the spontaneous formation of the molecules necessary for living systems. And since this experiment was done, a whole bunch of other kinds of similar situations, modeling other sorts of environments on early Earth, have been run. And I've also had similar results where the molecules necessary for life have been spontaneously produced. But of course, life itself was not produced in this experiment and certainly hasn't been produced in any other experiment. Looking at our next step, the origin of cells, the evidence in the fossil record for cellular life dates back to about four billion years ago. These structures that you see down here are stromatolites. They're actually the modern day equivalent of some of our oldest fossils. Here's our stromatolite fossil from 3.5 billion years ago. So we have evidence of cellular life in the fossil record for quite a bit of Earth's history. If you consider that Earth is 4.5 billion years old, by four billion years ago, there's evidence of structures built by cells. And certainly by three and a half billion years ago, we definitely see that evidence. In terms of putting everything together inside of a cell, we're not really going to get into that here in this video. There are plenty of resources for all of the evidence that we're talking about here that you can definitely consult if you wanna see the kind of work that people are doing right now. I'm really just going to focus on sort of the broad strokes for this video, but you can see one piece of evidence that I'll point to here is that it is not hard to get biological molecules to form into compartments. What I mean by this is you can take lipids and you can get them to spontaneously organize themselves into the compartments that you see over here. They've got different names depending upon how they're organized, but they'll do that spontaneously simply by putting them in water and shaking them around a little bit. But I wanna be very clear, no one has as of yet put all of the requirements for life into one compartment in a laboratory setting. That just has not been accomplished and it may very well never be accomplished. If you think about the time horizons necessary for these steps to occur, it could have taken 100 million, 200 million, half a billion years to get something like this to happen. And that's no problem in early Earth's history. We've got plenty of time for this to occur. So it may be unrealistic to expect that anybody is ever going to spontaneously create life in the laboratory. We can still investigate what had to have happened in order to get life to originate on the Earth. Our next step would be to develop an information storage molecule in our modern cells. It's our DNA. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that perhaps early cells used RNA as their information storage molecule. That's because RNA, which is very similar to DNA, except that it's a single-stranded molecule with a couple of chemical differences, RNA has the ability in modern cells to both store information, it's what DNA information gets copied into before it gets turned into proteins, and also catalyze reactions. Ribosomes, which we'll talk a lot more about in our next unit, are actually built out of RNA molecules. RNA can do both information storage and help catalyze chemical reactions, which might suggest that that's the first step in the development of an information storage molecule. These RNA molecules are called ribozymes, and these are catalytic molecules of RNA that can carry out different kinds of chemical reactions. People can create these in the laboratory, then you can get them to do all sorts of interesting things. For instance, you can get ribozymes that are actually autocatalytic in their own copying. They can copy themselves and you can evolve them to copy themselves faster and faster. It's really quite fascinating, but it's not something we can really talk about too much here. But all of this comes together to this notion of an RNA world. You may see this term from time to time. And this refers to sort of the hypothetical time before the development of DNA, when the information storage molecules in early life on Earth were RNA molecules instead. And then of course we have to get everything to reproduce. So we have some understanding of how cells reproduce in the modern era, and we'll talk a lot more about that over the time in our year together. There are 
scientists actively investigating the origin of cell of cell division and reproduction. I will not go into any of that here. It's just beyond the level of resolution necessary for the course. And so I'm going to put a big question mark here. It doesn't really mean that there's no evidence. It just means that I'm going to leave that evidence untouched for the purpose of our discussion. Certainly, if you are interested in digging into any of the evidence that underlies each of these steps, the work that's being done right now, investigating all of it, I'll definitely leave some resources below the video that you can check out like always, and we can go from there. But I think it's important to realize that the lack of evidence is not a fatal flaw for any of these hypotheses. That's how science works. We go and gather evidence to inform our thinking on these topics. And the origin of life continues to be an active area of scientific research. So thanks so much for watching our video on the origin of life. Please make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can compare models of the origin of life, panspermia and abiogenesis. Explain what has to happen in order to produce life that approximates the kind of life that we see on Earth these days. And make sure you can describe the evidence that supports the models of the origin of life and the steps that have to occur to go from non-living matter to living systems. If you could do those, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.